At 16, I'm black with family in Alabama. They farm and own a vast amount of land in Huntsville. My uncle owns a big house and several trailers for hunting or camping. My cousins from the south suggest we go camping, teasing me as a city kid from Chicago. We gather food, slaughter a pig and some chickens, and bring necessities for camping out for a few days. When we arrive at the camp, something feels off. The air has a strange electric smell, like right before a storm, reminiscent of ozone. Despite this, we think nothing of it and unpack, heading down to a nearby creek to swim. Suddenly, an older white man and a white teenager emerge from the bushes, the man holding a shotgun. He greets us and inquires about our presence so deep in the woods. I mention my uncle, whom he knows, and explain that we're camping. He warns us about a big animal in the woods, and his son, who's my age, asks if he can stay and hang out with us, to which his father agrees. We stop using the green text format as the story progresses. We spent the day playing football with me and the white kid Tanner, along with five of my cousins and four of their friends, totaling five girls and six boys, all around the ages of 15 to 17. We pass the time until evening and then head back to camp, preparing for a campfire. Tanner mentions that his family's property is adjacent to my uncle's and expresses a desire to ask his dad if he can join us camping. My cousin Rooster volunteers to accompany him, along with one of the girls. As it approaches 7 o'clock and darkness begins to fall, they take flashlights and head down the trail towards Tanner's property, the rest of us hang out. We make s mores, drink, and spend time with the girls. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's that smell of ozone again. It cuts through the scent of the fire we had going. This really unpleasant, metallic smell is similar to what you might notice after a nosebleed has stopped. It's not exactly like dried blood, but it has that metallic, unpleasant odor. We immediately think it might be some sort of electrical issue, or maybe someone left a hot plate on or something. We check the trailers, but nothing's on, and we all can smell it. Suddenly, we hear people sprinting down the path toward us, and Rooster, Tanner, and the girl all come rushing into the clearing, out of breath. Without pausing, they all head straight into the trailer where the fire is. We all hurry inside the trailers. They eventually calm down, even Rooster is really upset at this point. Meanwhile, the fire is dying down, so my other cousins decide to go outside to retrieve the generator from a shed between the trailers. Tanner says, no way. Lock the front door, nobody else is going outside. He's been crying too, his eyes red and swollen, his pants dirty. He explains that they went back to his house. His father agreed he could go camping, but warned them to be careful on the way back, suggesting they take one of the hunting rifles just in case. Apparently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days earlier. One of their pigs had been torn up and partially eaten. They assumed it was probably big cats or coyotes, even though they usually don't mess with live animals. Tanner packed his stuff and told his dad they'd be fine without the rifle because coyotes tend to avoid people. So they started walking back toward our campsite, so, Rooster finally calms down, and the girl had already stopped crying but she was just staring out the window with a blank expression. Rooster explains that they had gotten halfway into the woods toward the camp when they started hearing noises in the forest. It was almost completely dark by this time, so they weren't sure at first what it was. The girl mentions that she heard something in the bushes right off the trail, and they all shine their flashlights over there, and there's someone standing back in the woods in a little hollow. Rooster said they yelled at him, telling him he was scaring them and being rude. That's when Rooster realized that the guy was facing away from them. So they keep walking, and they start smelling that unpleasant coppery ozone smell. They say that they look off into the forest on the opposite side, and there's another person standing in the forest, facing backward and slightly closer to the path. So now they start walking faster, and Tanner keeps saying, I should have taken the rifle. As they're telling the story, the smell is still really strong, even inside the cabin. 
They say that after they started walking faster, a kind of low gibbering started coming from both sides of the woods. And as they started hurrying back to the trailer, the girl says she had shown her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them and had seen something moving through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder, and when they could see the light from our campfire, something had emerged from the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the trail, and they had just sprinted as hard as they could back to the trailer. So we're out in the woods, and at this point, we're assuming it's some locals or something trying to mess with us, all of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts talking about how he went to school with a native kid who was telling him about the goatman or something. We promptly tell him to stop because we don't need any scary stories right now. But he just keeps going on about how it's the goatman, and how we're in his territory and all that. At the time, I had never heard of this goatman or any of that, but then a couple of years ago, before I graduated from college, I had a Menominee roommate, and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically a man with the head of a goat, and he can shape shift, and he gets among groups of people to scare them. It's also supposed to be kind of like the Wendigo, and it's bad luck to even talk about it, and even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, I didn't know this back when I was 16. So my cousin keeps saying, the goatman's going to get us. The girls are all terrified, and my cousins and I are all trying to figure out if it's just some locals messing with us or if it's some animal. Then, all of a sudden, the smell just disappears. To this day, I haven't experienced anything like it. Usually, smells fade away or lessen. It was just there one second and gone the next. So after an hour, making it around 9 or 10, we've calmed down enough to go back outside and start the fire again. We figure it was probably just some people trying to scare us, so we don't go back home because we're afraid they might chase us through the woods or something crazy like that. Nothing else weird happened that night, and we decided to stay another night. For the most part, the second night was uneventful. At about 1 in the morning, we're outside drinking and telling ghost stories. As someone finishes up a spooky tale I don't remember what it was about the smell returns. It's so strong that one of the girls starts vomiting. I stand up, and you can feel how humid the air is. I suggest we go inside, something doesn't feel right, and we should have just left. We all retreat indoors, and we're gathered around. My cousin keeps insisting it's the goatman, while Rooster tries to get him to shut up. Meanwhile, I just have this feeling that something is off, but I can't quite put my finger on it. We end up sitting there for a while, the smell is still strong, and we're all terrified, huddled inside the camper. We end up cooking brats for everyone because nobody wants to venture outside. We have a total of three packs, each containing four brats. I grill them up on the stove and distribute one to each person. I take mine, and after a while, one of my cousins goes over to the pot for another one. He starts complaining about how I got two brats while everyone else only got one, and I look at him incredulously. I explain that everyone only got one because there were only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open a new pack and cook some more. That's when the girl who had been out with Rooster and Tanner starts screaming, Oh Jesus, oh Lord, get it out. She's crying and shaking, and then it dawns on the cousin standing up what's wrong. He and I both glance around the room, and then I feel my heart sink. I bolt out of the cabin, and the girl runs out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side as everyone rushes out. One of my cousin's friends asks what's wrong. I start counting us. There's only eleven now. I swear to you, my cousin confirms. There had been twelve people in the cabin. But since everyone didn't really know each other well, nobody had noticed the whole time that there was an extra person. And then I realized that earlier, I had kind of sensed something was off. You know how when you're just messing around, having a good time, you don't pay attention to the small details, and you don't always keep track of everything I'm dead certain that someone else had been in the trailer with us, and they had been there for at least a day, eating with us. 
What makes it worse is that I couldn't figure out who because I don't think anyone actually interacted with the other person or the goatman. The girl kept praying to Jesus, and we're all outside, eventually, we grab big sticks and cautiously go back into the cabin, but there's nobody in there. We count again, and there are still 11 people. We return to the trailer and lock the door. We explain what happened, and the girl says that she also realized it, and when she was about to say something, the person sitting next to her had grabbed her leg hard and leaned over toward her, saying something she couldn't understand, so we're all scared as hell as we huddle together, and eventually, I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just rising, and half of the group is still asleep while the others are packing our stuff. Some of us want to walk back home immediately, but four people want to wait until the sun is fully up. And there are a few who think we're just messing around and still want to stay at the trailers. I just want to get out of the woods. The girl's name was Kira, the one who had been touched by the goatman. Anyway, I asked her if she really thought it was something bad, and she said she just wanted to go home and didn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decide to split up, the four who want to leave can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin, and it's my uncle's property, so I have to lock up. I'm really pissed off at this point because I feel like people aren't taking this situation seriously, and I definitely didn't want to spend another night in the woods. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the others now four girls and four guys to leave. Tanner leaves with them to get a rifle and says he'll be back. So there are just seven of us left by 4 p.m. By 5 p.m., he hasn't returned yet, and we're getting extremely anxious. The only reason I stopped insisting they leave was because he went to get a gun. Around 5.30 p.m., the cousin who stayed with us says that Kira is outside. We all look outside, and sure enough, she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, if she was so scared, why would she come back and then I get this sick feeling in my stomach. Throughout this time, the coppery smell has been gone, but now I realize I can smell just a hint of it. I say this to the rest of them, and everybody these are the same people who wanted to stay in the woods after we had the damn goatman among us is laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like, I'm not joking at all right now. I ask them, why would I mess around like that? So one of the girls goes outside to get Kira. She gets halfway to her and stops suddenly. Kira starts heaving, it's hard to describe. It's like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this detail that made me realize there wasn't a single sound in the whole woods, it was completely silent. This was in late September, so it was still fairly warm, but it could get chilly some days too. Usually, you could hear geese honking or some kind of bird or squirrel making noise. So I step out the door and tell her to come back in right now. She backs up into the trailer, and we lock the door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy turns to say that she's still there. Then there's a huge bang on the door. We all jump up and scramble around the living room of the trailer. The banging is incredibly loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls, and the other two are nervously giggling, while me and the other two guys are terrified. Then we hear Tanner. He's screaming, stop playing. Let me the hell in. So we go over to the door and open it, and Tanner stumbles in with the rifle. There's nobody else outside. Apparently, he had walked up to the campsite. Nothing strange happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it wasn't Kira standing there. When he had reached the edge of the clearing, she had turned toward him with a slack-jawed look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it wasn't until he was almost halfway to the trailer that he realized she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire, and without him even seeing her move, she had been turning, inching closer. He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin, hoping it would be open. 
and when he got to the door and found it locked, he turned, and she was about halfway to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He pulls me aside and whispers in my ear, you know there are only seven of us in here, right I get that feeling where your stomach drops. It had been back inside the trailer while we were sorting out who was going where, and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day. It had just slipped right back in. We look out the window, and there's nobody out there. So we count everyone again, and then, basically, I go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier. And everybody says eight. I say, well, how many are here now they all do the count and then realize there are only seven people in the cabin. So Tanner had brought back a couple of boxes of ammo and his rifle. He had told his dad that there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was a goat. He says that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours, and that in the morning we can all go back to his place, and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really terrified, but at least I feel better because we can defend ourselves if whatever it is comes back. But then my cousin gets into a huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks I'm trying to be funny and prank them. She's getting really scared and says I'm not funny. My cousin keeps telling her I'm not that kind of person, but she insists, well, how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig or if it's really Goatman, how do we know that this is the real Tanner and that Goatman didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we get into a huge argument about this, where Tanner and I are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking into our trailer without us knowing and mingling with us, and at worst, something bad is in the forest messing with us. One of the girls is crying and saying she wants to leave right now, and we're trying to tell her we shouldn't because none of us should walk through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to set, and it's getting a little cloudy out. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we can't really get a decent station out there. So we turn it off just as Tanner's cousin shows up. He's about 19, I think. At this point, the sun is barely over the horizon, and he has a heavy-duty lantern flashlight and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer, and we whisper to Tanner, asking if he's sure that's his cousin, and he says yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy I figured she would meet me up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something he also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pans all the way up the trail. We all deny it and ask him what he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tanner had been using, and he had encountered one of you guys buddies standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him slack jawed. He had asked her several questions, but she just kept staring. Then she smiled at him, and he continued walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and lagged a little behind. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help, but she just continued staring. Eventually, he turned around a bend in the trail. But when he went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. He assumed she had taken a shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We tell him the whole story of what's been going on. I half expected him to say we were making it up, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl. He says that when she kept trying to lag behind him, it kind of weirded him out, so he tried to keep her in front of him. But no matter how slowly he walked, she was always a little behind. And he smelled this nasty smell, and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually, it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't catch, and when he turned around, she was right up on him, and he stepped back. At this point, he asked her if she was okay and if she needed him to carry her back, but she just kept staring. He reached out for her shoulder, but she seemed to move while he was looking at her. So at this point, we know this is real, unless Tanner is playing a joke, which we can tell he's not because he's almost panicking. So they load up their rifles, 
we eat some more, and we just kind of sit around until about 11. To this day, every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed so I would be scared for the rest of my life. Around 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty, gross, blood-like smell, like cooking blood and singed hair. Tan and his cousin, Reese, instantly get up and grab the rifles. There's like a half knocking, half clawing at the door, and I swear to you, there's this voice, and it sounds like those YouTube cats and dogs whose owners teach them how to talk. It says in this halting, weirdly toned voice, let me in, stop playing, it made my nerves crawl, and one of the girls started crying and calling on Jesus. It was obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence, and that's something I never realized until that moment, but all people have a certain rhythm to their speech, no matter the language. This thing didn't have any kind of cadence or rhythm. It sounded like one of those YouTube cats that's the best comparison. Now I'm in full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside, who is it stop messing around? And it just keeps repeating, let me in or in for almost 15 minutes. It sounded like this, almost not funny. Sorry for going off on a tangent, but if you can't imagine how it sounded, then you can't imagine how messed up the whole situation was. Then the smell goes away for a while. And for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods. Every couple of minutes, it comes back into the room and says something. Finally, when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning. Reese says, enough of this. And opens the door, walking outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air and says something like, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away. He fires two more times, and then from the woods right by the river across from the trailer, it sounds like something is slowly gibbering and hooting, then it starts screaming, a horrifying mix between a woman's scream and a cat screeching. I've never heard anything like it, and you can hear the brush over that way start to shake. Reese fires into the tree lean and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door, and we can hear this thing keening and screaming. Reese says something had emerged from the bushes, low to the ground, and was crawling toward the cabin. He had shot at it. Pretty much, that's how the rest of the night went, it was constantly screaming for the next two hours, and we could hear movement in the tree lean. But it never approached the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tan had been watching the door with his rifle, nobody else heard or saw this, and he told me two days later, after the whole thing was over. He said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us, and he nodded off. Then he said he realized something was wrong, and while pretending to be asleep, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He didn't want to try to shoot at the thing in the cabin and risk it harming us all, or have Reese wake up and start shooting, potentially harming us. So he stayed awake all night, pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing or heave like it was laughing. But then it would lay back down. The story concludes rather anticlimactically because, from my perspective, nothing else happened. We woke up, and I noticed that Tan was a little jittery, avoiding eye contact with all of us. Nonetheless, we had breakfast, packed up, and began walking to his house. He stayed behind to lock up the cabin and promised to catch up with us. I wasn't too keen on the idea, but we proceeded. As we walked a bit up the path, Tan came running up, and we ended up jogging back to his house. His cousin then drove us home. Later, Tan discovered something unsettling. There was a window in the bathroom, and he found it open when he went to lock up. We had overlooked locking a screenless window. It seemed that whatever had been haunting us had been using that window all along, waiting for an opportunity to sneak in while we slept. It accompanied us all the way back to Tan's house, lingering at the back of the group before disappearing into the woods, 
locking eyes with Ten before doing so. Hey, Stalker. Hope you enjoyed the video. If I could trouble you, give a like and a sub, it really helps the cause. And since you're already here, why not watch the next video? Anyways, stay comfy. Cortisol is bad for you.